morning. So good to be here with you to praise and worship the Lord and give him thanks for all the things that he has done and all at the same time remembering those that give their life and sacrifice themselves for um, this nation. I know many people look forward to celebrate, but it's a day to just um, emphasize and, and honor and, and respect those that have um, died for our nation. This afternoon at 2, I have the privilege to say a prayer and um, blessing in the town of Florida at a memorial for the Memorial Day celebration there. Um, let's, let's, um, we're, I have a lot to share with you this morning. First of all, I'm back, as you can see. I had a couple of days to um, rest, and also I did minister. It was a different um, experience. Um, it was very, very good to um, uh, learn more. I have to say to you, honestly, I'm very burdened about preaching the gospel and the brokenness that exists in humanity and how Jesus is the only answer, no matter what we, no matter what we do or say. Uh, so, but I'm glad I was able to share. I, I, I don't have the pictures ready. I preached a couple of times and I, we did minister to some people that are in need. And thank you for all of you that um, have given me those clothes. Because when I go there and I speak, they can relate because they have been blessed or they use what we um, send to them to minister to those people that are in need. Talk about angels, I was able to, um, do you know, sometimes we want to do everything, we want to see results quickly. We're able to just hand up some groceries to some people and it's, Roy was talking about angels. You, you have to see when you sh show up at someone's door, they don't expect you and you are that angel because they don't have any groceries at home. And you bring a bag and you give it to them. If you could see their face. And to me, that was one of those moments. I'm saying, God, only you know what this woman prayed today. And she's sitting at outside and the answer comes. I know I cannot solve all the problems because they're too big to solve, too many. But God works in mysterious ways. But I'm learning also to look at God as the doer and creator of all things. And God has his own ways to work to bring us to him for his glory. And that's where we have to learn how to put our eyes on him. So I'm thankful for your prayers, your support. And Pastor Ernesto and the whole church sends um, his, um, um, what is it, what do you say? Say thank you, regards to you. I took, I took one, KK gave me a pair of sneakers, and I promised him the person that received those sneakers, I, will t I have the picture though, I will take a picture. And I took the picture, and I have his name, I told him I came on a mission to hand the sneaker to one, it was like a 10-year-old boy that needed the sneaker. So thank you for KK's, he's a missionary, amen, thank you. We know the last couple of weeks or things has happened that's very dramatic with the loss of life in school and all that stuff that we have to pray for. But I want to remind you about this. This happens every single day. Okay? The news tend to give more, more um, um, push to one to another. Every single day, people are losing their lives. Okay? And because every single life has a value. But we think sometimes because it's a lot, no, every single lot, every single day, somebody, maybe a child, has got killed in the alleyway, and the news will never, ever say anything about it. Uh, we, as people of God, we have to pray for the people in Texas, the ones in Buffalo, that they can find comfort. But the main thing, that they can find Jesus. Do you know it's hard? I don't want to take too much time from Pastor Joe to preach. Do you know, wherever you go, you see depravity. Sin is weird. Somebody can be without nothing to eat, but they'll find a way to party and party bad. Because depravity is wherever you go. And that's what we see today here in our nation. But God has positioned us 
in a way to pray and to seek because our hope is not in material things in spiritual things so let's pray so let's pray right now would you stand with me we're going to pray for these families hallelujah heavenly father we bless you we praise you because we are your children and you have placed us as a church god to be light in the darkness we don't understand oh god at this moment what it, what it suffer like the parents or family members of the children are suffering or other people, Father God. We cannot fathom it. But we know that you have given us the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. And right now, God, we call upon him, we call upon you to comfort these lives, oh, Father God, wherever they are. And, Father, we pray that through these things they can find you because ultimately that's the only thing that matters. To find you as Lord and Savior. So we pray, God, for them. We pray for the people that today are grieving the loss of their, of their loved ones, God. The soldiers, the mom and dad. Because we live in a broken society. And only you can mend, Father. So we ask you to mend today the hearts, the pain, the hurt, the widows, oh God. The orphans, the children, Father God. Oh God, we need you. We need you today. So may, Lord God, your word reaches them, O oh Father God, and they can respond in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And one final thing is I need prayer. We ask you guys to pray. Next Sunday we're going to have a special guest speaker to preach about Pentecost because it's going to be Pentecost Sunday. And the week after is a week of prayer. You saw an announcement. Please join us and pray. We need to pray. Not only when there is, the world is in a crisis. Don't go up and down. We need to pray. The world is in a crisis. People need Jesus. And you are called to exercise your faith. Okay? Yes, parking. As you know, they are reconstructing around here. And sometimes it's a little bit, I came back, I'm saying, wow, that looks so confusing. <laughs> But we believe there is a plan. Okay. We did express our concerns to the state, to the DOT, about the way they are changing our, um, the access to our church. So we are receiving some response, and they're willing to help us, uh, if you can envision this. If you cannot, you'll see in the future. They're willing to help us maybe come up with a way to enter the parking lot over there <laughs> from Forbes Street. Okay. And so, what we're looking for is this. We're looking for a miracle. The miracle is to ex extend that parking lot further down that way so we don't have to use the one across the street. So, I need a miracle. I know a God that owns, what they say, the cattle on a thousand hills. The Bible tells me silver and gold and heads. So I told the board already, I'm choosing to believe something, something big. That somehow a miracle will happen. We can have that whole parking lot and don't even pay much. Nothing to no. Oh, no, a market person, okay, nothing, yes. But there's, okay, let me go away. So, but I want you to pray. I want you to pray. We're still talking. I'm waiting to see what can happen way that lot over there because all that most of the land that you see there is grass belongs to the church and all the parking we have across the street belongs to the church and people are willing maybe to buy that lot so we can do something better better here so we can accommodate everyone okay so i want you to pray if i go to explain to you all what i'm talking about some of you will not get it because some of you think the parking lot is this way it's that way okay and it's hard to, so I want you to pray for a miracle. Did you hear me? Let's say miracle. miracle. Say it again. Miracle. Amen. So we're going to believe God. God did it in the past. And God can do greater and better in the days to come. Amen. So with all this said, I'm going to ask Pastor Joe Prisk um, to come here. What do you have in that bag? You cannot tell me what's in the bag? So why do you bring it for? It's pets there. It's pets? Pets, what's in the bag? You cannot share either? 
Oh, okay. it's interesting bag. You look good in that bag, too. Wow. You look amazing. Don't get shy now. Let's pray for you. Dear Lord, we, we thank you for Pastor Joe. God, we, we pray, God, for him. Also, we pray for Pat, for strength, wisdom. And we ask him, God, to use him for your glory. God, we're here to serve you. We desire to hear from your Holy Spirit as your promise. So I pray that you take away anything from self, from man. God, and you empower the divine nature in him. That every single word that comes from his lips reaches our heart. God, speak this morning. Convict. God, comfort. Rebuke, Lord God, so that your name can be glorified. We pray for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. It's a privilege that uh, Pastor Sig asked me to, to share with you. And I consider it a privilege. Um, as you can tell, I mean, I'm really praying and uh, grieving with the people of Uvalde. Uh, the devil is on the move. But, and that's not to, you find devils under your dish rags and all that stuff. I'm not, I'm not afraid of the devil because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So, yeah, the devil's going to get nuts in the end times. You're right. He has always been nuts, but he's going to get kind of nutsier. Um, but the church is going to get stronger. I believe the closer that Jesus comes, the church is going to just get stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. So, you know, it bothers me that other people have to kind of, you know, be involved with his nonsense. But the church is rising up. Hallelujah. This church is rising up. We're rising up in the power of the Holy Ghost to stand against the enemy. I want to share today from the fourth chapter of the book of Luke. And so if you have your, um, your Bible, paper Bible, electronic Bible, whatever Bible you have, turn to it uh, so you can look at the word yourself. I think there's a power when you read the word yourself. I really do, whether it be mechanical or whatever. But when you read those words... They move their way into your spirit. Well, okay, I'm going to read from verse 1. And I'll start out with this way. The, the devil was having a picnic. And he was inviting all kinds of crazy people like himself. And, you know, they were making goodies for the picnic. So they made some devil food cake. They made some devil dogs. And they even made devil ham. And uh, they made devil eggs, too. And, but let's look at, so he's offering this stuff. And the devil offers stuff to get us to come into where he's at. In chapter 4 of the book of Luke, he's going to offer Jesus some stuff to see if he can bite on it. As he offers you and me as Christians. The Bible says this, and I'll be reading from the New King James. It says, then Jesus, from verse 1, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And I encourage you, if you're in the wilderness, don't think that God's forsaken you. God may have led you into the wilderness to make you stronger. That's why he led Jesus in. He didn't. He loved Jesus, led him into the wilderness. Verse 2, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days, he ate nothing. And afterwards, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. The first thing that Pat has in her bag here is Hershey Kisses. A anybody like this? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I can't throw the whole bag. I hit somebody and knocked them out, so I can't, you know. <laughs> you know, the devil, he offers candy most times. Something looks sweet. Something looks good 
to get us to go his way. Remember, Jesus is full of the Holy Spirit, and he just had been baptized. And you know what he heard when he was baptized? You are my beloved son. In verse 22, chapter 3 in Luke. You are my beloved son, who am well pleased. So he's led into the wilderness to face the snake. The same tempter that tempted Adam and Eve is now going to tempt him. But he's the second Adam. He's the second Adam, and he's different than the first. So the tempter tries to pull the same thing he pulled on, uh, on Adam and Eve. Because you know the tactics of the devil doesn't change. They don't, he's not that smart. He just uses the same old stuff over and over and over again. So, so Jesus has fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and here the devil comes and offers him a, a Hershey kiss. He says, which is interesting, if you are the Son of God. Now, Jesus just heard God say he was the Son of God. He pulls this on us as much as on Jesus. He gives us the if. Well, if God loved you, are you really a Christian? I mean, if you were a Christian. So he says that to Jesus. You're hungry, huh, boy? 40 days, that's a long time. I got a way for you to buy bread, to get bread. I got a way that's beyond God that you can have some bread. Just turn the stones to bread. Go around the Lord. You don't have to trust the Lord for bread. Just do a magic trick and make some. Isn't it amazing we live in a microwave culture? We pray and we want three minutes to come to pass. Maybe even less than that. We even want it our way. Was that Burger King or McDonald's or? Hurry up, God. I need some bread. And if you don't come through, I'm going to have a Hershey kiss from the devil. Because it's fast. Jesus understood the devil, but he understood how faithful his father was too. He understood that in the wilderness, his father fed people with manna. And when they weren't satisfied with that, he had burgers just fly in as doves. So they had meat and they had bread. Jesus knew that God. We need to know that God will supply for us. It doesn't matter how long it takes. doesn't matter what it's looking like. God is a faithful God. And he will supply your needs. I've always stuck to the scripture that says, I have never seen the righteous begging bread or their children going hungry. You might say, well, oh, it, can you believe that? And you see, there's the devil again, you know, like to Eve. Did God really say that? And if we as Christians stand there and go, I'm not sure, man. I don't think I've read that portion in the Word. The devil says, you don't even know the Word. Now you're mine. We have to know the Word of the Lord. We have to. It's not an option. Jesus knew it, and you know where his devotions were? In the book of Deuteronomy. You ever read that? I mean, it's so dry. But here, this guy knows Deuteronomy, Jesus. Boom, 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 boom. We need to know the word like that. Doesn't matter to me. You know, somebody told me, he said, you know, the, the devil is always abused when he sees the Bible well used. You, you know that? Wear it out. You can buy another one. Wear it out. But let it come out of your mouth. Let it be the sword that's right in the devil's face. Let it be that way. If you it can't read well, then listen to it on the phone. Just get a pair of headphones and listen to the word. Continue to listen to it. You know, I heard one, one guy told me one time, he said, well, I've read the Bible once. I don't need to read it again. I said, what do you think? It is a storybook or something? It's not a storybook. It's the way we live. It's the word of life to us. So Jesus says, the devil says, hey, man, 
I'm going to turn something that's a natural, uh, a hunger in you that's natural. You know, hunger's natural. There's nothing sinful about it. I'm going to turn into an obsession. I'm going to make you think about it all the time. I'm going to make you almost go crazy until you get something. That's how he turns it on you. On me, too. We have natural desires that are natural. God stuck them in there. There's nothing wrong with them until the enemy comes and twists them. And now they become obsessions. You know, I don't feel good today. Oh, you don't. I'm going to twist that and drive you into depression. It really does. We have to be on guard as Jesus was on guard. And remember what Jesus said. He said something very simple but came from Deuteronomy. He said, man shall not live by bread alone. By what? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, because the word feeds your spirit. You know, you can't stick a hot dog in your spirit, you know. Burgers aren't going to fit in your spirit. It doesn't really matter. The word of God is what feeds your spirit. So sometimes you're walking around, you haven't read the word for four or five days. You know what? You're starving. I don't understand why my life's going nuts. Well, have you been in the Word today? Well, I don't have time. Well, I'll tell you something. The devil has time. He knows when the Word's in there and the Word's not in there. You got to eat the Word to strengthen your body. Read the Word every single day. Not an option. Every day. So Jesus said, listen, man will not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So, so Jesus gets by the first one with flying colors. Hallelujah. <laughs> the tempter tries to turn that natural hunger into something that's an obsession. The bread in the wilderness, Jesus remembers. But the devil says, God may let you starve. See the twist again. You may starve. You may not be able to pay your bills. You may die. Now that's from the enemy. Because Jesus got your back. If you die, you go to heaven. You win. You need to know what the word says and when to use it. Jesus knew what his father could do. And he knew what he would do. So he knew the faithfulness of God. If you look at the scripture that he quoted in Deuteronomy, if you turn there, because sometimes I like to look at, if there's a quote, I like to go back and find it and see what it says. So in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 8, we're going to read what Jesus quoted. So it's, he starts out by saying this. In verse 1, every commandment which I command you today, you must carefully observe, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. Verse 2, and you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way through these 40 days in the wilderness to humble you and test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to, to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that, the, that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. That's the scripture that Jesus quoted. The second thing in Pat's bag here is, Which one do you like better, kisses or this one? <laughs> okay, all right. So, You know, the reason I, I got Reese's Pieces, because you ever notice when they're in like a party or something, sometimes you see them and then they're gone. 
I always wondered, where do they go? They just, Chuh! they're gone. People love those things, I know. In the second temptation in Luke 4, we're going to see something that the devil does. He can change the way you look at things. If, if you look at it, the second one here in, in chapter uh, 4, it says, uh, verse 5, chapter 4 of Luke again. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority w will I give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore... And we won't go to the next one. So the devil's saying, I'm going to play a little hocus pocus here with you. He can change the way you look at things. In, when the enemy was in the garden with Adam and Eve, remember what happened in Genesis 3. It says, when you eat of it, the, the tree that God said don't, your eyes will be opened. Their eyes were open already, but you'll see something else. You will see things in a different light. And he said, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God. And then the woman said, she saw the tree. She had, she had looked at that tree many times, but now it looked different. It looked a little changed. She said, well, that's a nice tree. and Boy, that fruit looks really good now. The devil's an illusionist. Changes things. Mess with your head. Mess with your eyes. Make you see things you must have. Obsession. He'll turn something from, hey, I can only afford a... Well, now you can't even afford a car. But anyway, I could only afford a Ford. But boy, those Teslas, they just look really good. He'll change the way you look at things. You'll see a, a woman as a sister in the Lord, and suddenly she's an object of lust. And for women, you'll see a man, and he's a stable man in the Lord, and suddenly he's a hot stud. What happened? Something changed the way you looked at the devil's mess with your eyes. So he pulled that in. So in Jesus, he says, I want to do the same thing. I want to see if it works on him. So he takes him up, shows him all the world in a minute of time, and does the magic. All the kingdom he showed him in a minute of time. But Jesus was focused on another kingdom. He was focused on the kingdom of God. In these last days, we need to be focused on the kingdom of God. We serve a different king. His name is Jesus. He is the one who bought us. We serve him alone. No matter how the world goes, and it's going to go nuts, we serve a kingdom that can't be shaken. We have a God that doesn't move. No matter what we see. You know, I, I agree with Pastor Siegfried. You know, the news focuses on certain things, and it's kind of candy to your eyes. Things like that happen all the time. The devil's on the move most of the time. But the kingdom doesn't change. What we will talk about in heaven is the kingdom of God. Where we're going, there's buildings called the kingdom of God. We're going up yonder. To see the Lord. That's where we're going. We're strangers down here. We are. We're sojourners. We're strangers. The problem is sometimes we get too comfortable being down here. Isn't this nice? Well, no, it's not nice. It's not nice. We're going up yonder. We're going somewhere else. We always have to remember there's a kingdom with a king that we serve. And that's what Jesus knew. Jesus knew, yeah, you can show me all this stuff. Isn't that great? But I know the real kingdom of God, and I'm going there. So I don't really care what you say. 
It doesn't matter. In Colossians chapter 3, it says this. Seek the things that are above where Christ is seated. Seek them. Desire them. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. The earth is passing away. The kingdom is being established. And that's, we're citizens of that. Now, there's a third one that he throws at him. Let's see what else is in Pat's bag here. How about those? How many people like these? Now, some people like all three of them. You, you can't, you know, you got to. <laughs> Twizzlers. This is my son's favorite, by the way. Um, remember the end of the second one. The devil says this. He said, I'll give you all these kingdoms because I have the authority to give it. I took it away from Adam. If you want it, I'll give it to you. And you only have to do one thing. One thing. Do you know what that one thing was? Somebody read it in there? Oh, it's called worship. Worship, that's all, worship. And in fact, you know, there's a story that I remember. It's this. You know, in the first century, Romans were really, really terrible towards Christians. I think you know that. Not only did Stephen die and he was stoned, but they were actually lighting their parties with Christians. They were putting them on crosses and burning them so they have some tiki lights for their parties. They were thrown into lions. It wasn't easy being a Christian in the first century. Let me tell you, it's not easy being a Christian now. No, man, if, if you agree with everything the world says, boy, the world will love you. You know, I just read this morning my devotions. The world hated him. It's going to hate you. That's what it says. You know, so here they were burning Christians and doing all kinds of crazy stuff to the people of faith. But they had a place they were going. They were going up yonder. And you know what? God helped them and gave them grace within that time, as he's doing for us right now. I mean, you can't hear Roy's story without knowing that God is pouring grace down on the, on the world right now. He's throwing it in. He's pouring it on you. He's pouring it on me. He doesn't run out. In fact, the Bible says his mercies are every morning they're new. So if you use them all up today, you know what's going to happen tomorrow morning? You're going to have a bank account. It's all going to be there again. You can't outdo it. Hallelujah, right? <laughs> trying to concentrate, so don't get me going. <laughs> no, I, I really enjoy and be with you guys. He said this. So there was a young girl about 16 years old, and this is a story from Irenaeus. And um, so they were bringing the Christians up, and there was a statue of Caesar, and they said... Um, all you have to do is take a drop of oil and put it on the statue. That's all. And then you can go free and live your life fine. So people were coming up. Some were doing it. Some were doing it. So this 15, 16-year-old girl come up. And they gave her the oil. They said, all you got to do is drop it. That's all you got to do. That's all. So the girl said, I can't do that. Because Jesus is my God. I only worship him. I don't worship statues. That's what she said. So the Roman centurion turned to her and said, hey, girl, do you hear the lions? They're roaring. She said, yes, sir, I hear the lions. But do you hear the angels? Because they're calling me. She wouldn't do it. And they threw her to the lions. All Satan wants is one time for you to worship him. One time for you to turn and say, I don't trust God now. I got to trust this. That's all. Just this. Why do you think worship is so sacred? Why do you think the devil trashes worship all the time? Why do you think that is? Because he wants it. He just wants you to turn one time from Jesus and say, I trust you, devil. It's all he wants. I encourage you to never do that. I don't care what it costs you. I don't care what it costs you. 
Worship the Lord your God and him alone. And worship him with all your might. You know why? Because it gives the devil a black eye. Every time we're up here worship, I'm serious. It just goes, bam. <laughs> I ain't going to worship you. I'm worshiping Jesus, and that's it. You don't like it, snake tough. Resist the devil, and he shall flee. Resist the devil, and he shall flee. Worship the Lord. And Jesus said, I only worship the Lord God. That's it. I ain't worshiping nothing else. I ain't worshiping Washington. I ain't worshiping the culture. You know, you can worship other things. The devil comes in different forms. I ain't worshiping a man, and I ain't worshiping a woman. I'm worshiping Jesus. That alone. And that's sacred ground, isn't it? Don't let nobody take your sacred ground from you. It's too sacred, too sacred in that sense. Well, one more temptation, and it's this. Twizzlers. What do I mean by that? I want to read it first. The devil said to him, all authority, if you worship me, and then Jesus answered him in verse 8, Get behind me, Satan, for it's written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and alone you shall serve him. Verse 9, and here's the third one. Then he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, now here it is again, the kiss, if you are the son of God. He does that a lot, doesn't he? He says, Jesus, you want to, won't you take the Hershey kiss now? I know you're hungry, boy. If you are the son of God. Remember, he points his bony fingers at you and me too. If you are. If you are. My word says if I confess with my mouth, believe in my heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. You know what it says? I'm saved. That's it. I'm saved. Not by anything I've done. By grace alone you are saved. Not because of works. You're saved by grace. And that grace will never leave you. Because God is with you. Turn to somebody and say, God is with me. And you could say it with a little charismatic grit, you know. God is with me. Hallelujah. God is with me. And he won't forsake me. Hallelujah. So... He brought him up to the temple. He says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from this. Do another trick. Come on. What a way to to start a ministry. Imagine if if, if Pastor Amari went up the top of the roof and jumped off and angels held him up. You think the place would be packed next Sunday? (laughs) I think you have to turn him away, huh? Why? Because people want signs. You know, the Bible says that Jews seek signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ and him crucified. See, it doesn't matter to me. I think it's great when God does signs. I like it, you know. It really kind of blesses me. But, you know, if God never did another sign for me, the greatest sign he's ever done for me is he saved my soul. And, and listen to this. I say this because some of us think God owes us something. And Amari preached it last, last week. It was a great sermon. God don't owe me nothing. Already gave his son. He already shed the blood of his beloved. And I want what? More candy? If the greatest miracle in your life is not that God saved you, then you'll look for something else. And I'll tell you, it's the greatest miracle of my life. And some of you know my peace. You know what God did to me. He brought me out. I like to hear, I was listening to Brother Dan talking about being clean for, what, 18 years? I've been clean for 30 years. God took me out. He extended his hand and brought me out of the pit. And I love that song. He brought me out of a, the miry clay. He set my feet. That's my miracle. You want to hear my miracle? That's my miracle. 
Has God done great things beyond that? Sure. Bless Patty and I, all kinds of great stuff. My greatest miracle is that he saved my soul, made a place for me in heaven. So here's, here's Jesus, and he takes him up to the high place in, in Jerusalem, and he says, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down, for it's written. And now, you know what he does? He takes scripture, and he twists it a little bit. You know, the devil was there when the Bible was being written, you know. Just takes it. And you know what he does? And I wanted us to look at this. Because he quotes Psalm 91. Because he says, oh, this Jesus, man, he's really into the word. Great. Let me throw some word at him. See what he knows. That's why it's so dangerous when you hear a preacher preach 40 minutes from a scripture for one half of a scripture. You don't know the context of it. You don't know nothing about it. All you know is this guy's ranting and raving up there, foaming at the mouth, about a half a scripture. We must be discerners. We must be Bereans when it comes to this. We've got to know our word or we're going to be deceived. You know, the Bible says in the end times, many will be deceived. You know that. And many's hearts will will go cold. And many, many, hear this, will fall away from the faith. Because there'll be teachers that go around tickling folks' ears with half a verse and telling them what they want to hear, and and you can be deceived by it. Because that's what the devil does. He just twists a little scripture. It really kind of grieves me that I hear people talking about, they get up in the morning, and they turn on the TV or the radio or whatever, and they hear one guy preaching this half a verse, and another guy preaching that half a verse, but if he can jump up and down and foam at the mouth a little bit, that must be the Holy Ghost. That's not the Holy Ghost. That's gas on his stomach. Let's discern what it is. If you don't discern, you'll be fooled. Believe me. It'll be twisted, and you won't know. Up from down, you won't know. So he goes, so the devil says, hey, you like the Scripture, huh, boy? You're throwing it at me pretty good. Well, let's see. I'll, I'll say it too. So he, he quotes Psalm 91. He says, if you get up on that high mountain and throw yourself off, you know what? The angels will bear you up. Does the Bible say that? Yes, it does. Out of context, you're exactly right. But it says it. And then he says another one from Psalm 91. And we're going to look at Psalm 91. And in their hands they will bear you up least you dash your foot against a stone. Now, if, if we weren't real good Bible searchers, and go to Psalm 91. I want you to look at it. Because the devil always leaves off a little bit. There's Psalm 91. You got that? And we're going to read it. We're going to read the whole thing. Because I want you to catch what the devil leaves out. And don't get me wrong, I'm not pounding on people who are on TV and the radio. Some of them are legit, some of them aren't. But we need to discern what that is. And I'm going to tell you something. This is, God really spoke to me. You know that I have another house in Pennsylvania, and my daughter's down there with her baby, and I've been enjoying that. That's what I've been doing. I'm the gypsy pastor, right? I come and go here. Um, But one of the things the Lord has really shown me lately is God inhabits the praises of his people. It just struck me, that verse, right? You know why? Because people get up on the stage. You know, some of you know that I'm a worship pastor down in PA. I was here too. But we have a great one in Fred, don't we? And I'm here to support him. and uh, Very excited to be support uh, Fred. But the praises of God are in the people. They're not in the hoochie coo on the stage. And we have to really watch this. You know why? Because idolatry is really, really subtle. It's so subtle. Sometimes we just get caught up and we don't even know we're worshiping something besides Jesus. You know, one church I went to, 
It was kind of a radical Jesus church, which I liked. It helped me because, <laughs> you know, I'm kind of on the edge too. But you know what? When they had worship, you know where the musicians were and the singers? In the congregation. There was nobody up on the stage. And one day I walked up to the pastor and I go, it's kind of strange. He said, the only thing we want to see on that stage is Jesus. Radical, no? Very radical. So, so this, this goes this. So, so he takes him up there and he quotes scripture to him. Psalm 91 says this, if you read it with me. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler. And, from, and I love this too because we're in the, still with this COVID thing over our head. He will deliver me from the perilous pestilence. COVID to me is a pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your buckler and shield and, and buckler. I don't know if Pat remembers this. We had a lady who went down to Washington, D.C. You remember this story? Anyway, she went down to Washington, D.C., and she was uh, marching with some Christians. And when the thing ended, when the, parade, you know, the protest ended, she was walking down an alley alone and somebody came up tried to molest her and take her purse she couldn't remember psalm 91 the whole thing so all she did when the guy tried to take her purse was she yelled feathers <laughs> and the guy ran away <laughs> the word of god works even if it <laughs> anyway, verse 5 says, and he shall, You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in the darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand shall fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near to you. Only with your eyes you shall look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. You know, somebody needs to say amen to that. You think you're going through some stuff. This is your psalm. Maybe you need to yell feathers once in a while, right? For he shall give. Now, here's the scripture he quotes. The devil quotes this. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. And in their hands you shall bear, they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Now, he stops there. But you see what the next verse says? <laughs> of course the enemy would stop at that verse. <laughs> because the next one says, You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Well, obviously he doesn't want him to know that one. But you see, Jesus knew the whole psalm. He didn't just know some of it. He knew all of it. And the word drove him. The word. So Jesus said, no candy for me today. You don't have to eat the candy. Just because it's served up. You don't have to eat it. You can say no. I resist you, devil. I won't eat it. I won't take it. And he takes that out of context. He will always do that. You have the power to stamp upon him, tread him under your feet. Jesus knew the whole psalm and God's power and the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And just to sum this up, and, you know, I, I don't, I'm not sharing this because I want you to be afraid of the devil. Please, that's not my intention. My intention is to empower you with the word so you can stand. And having done all, stand. You know, Ephesians 6, having done all, I'm going to close with these scriptures. 
The first one is James 4, 7. And that's the one we've been kind of talking about. But I just wanted to show it to you. And remember, too, that um, you hear somebody preach. That's great. But make sure it lines up with the word. I don't care who it is. I don't care how powerful he is or whatever he's saying. It always makes me nervous when I hear people like that. I got the power. I say, you got what? God's got the power. I don't know what you got, but I don't want any of it. <laughs> you know, because we're just vessels. Siegfried knows that, Amari and Dean. And I, I agree with uh, Pastor Siegfried that to share to his precious people like I've done this morning is dangerous because the pastor always gets the bullseye on his back. It always works like that. And the devil can take out a pastor, which he's done fairly well, then he succeeds and he laughs. And I really pray that you would um, pray for pastor, pray for Amari, encourage them, pray for them. If you've got to criticize them, keep it to yourself. Remember, the Bible says in Proverbs, there's seven things that God hates, and one is sowing discord among the brother. Remember that. God doesn't change. I mean, you know might like the style, you may not like whatever you like. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. So encourage your pastor, pastors, encourage him. When was the last time you slipped somebody a $50 bill or something, one of your pastors? I'm not talking about Christmas, man. Just encourage him. Take your wife out for a meal. You talk to the pastors. I, haven't, I have never seen a pastor that had too much encouragement. Have you? Have you ever come up to a pastor and said, hey, I want to encourage you today. I've got enough. <laughs> I'm full. I, I, I have never seen that. <laughs> I, I think it's important, and I, I do pray that um, you would encourage and pray for your pastors. Um, James chapter 4, verse 7 says this. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That's the word of God. That's not because you have an attitude or you think you're powerful or anything. That's the word of the Lord. Resist the devil, he'll flee from you. That's because that's the Holy Spirit stuff. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I get concerned when I see people rebuke and rebuke and rebuke and rebuke, and they're still doing the same stuff that they did before, and the devil just laughs at their rebuke. I don't want to get high anymore. I don't want to get high anymore. I rebuke you, devil of highness. But, you know, I just got a new bag of weed, and it is so good. That's hypocrisy. Remember, God can't hear those prayers because he looks at your heart. If your heart's not in it, don't pray it. Make sure it's your heart. Resist the devil. He will flee. Then it says, verse 8, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. He will lift you up. Another scripture, right? Just go left. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 15. Verse 15. Um, and I want to give a plug for the men's ministry. I, I am very involved in the men's ministry. Have been. Done it in Florida, done it in Pennsylvania. I don't believe that men can grow in the Lord just with a Sunday. They need, we, we as men need friends. It's hard to make friends on Sunday morning. Because you hello, goodbye, how you week, bless the Lord. We don't have time, basically. And I'm not saying women don't need it too, but I'm talking about as a man. I need a group of friends who are brothers in the Lord 
that I can sit down with weekly and share my heart and learn from the scripture how to be a better man. So on the 7th of June, I'm starting up men's ministry again here. Uh, it'll be, and, and if you sign up, there's, I think there's a sign up, I'm not sure. Anyway, if there's a sign up, sign up for, and the reason I say that is because we're going to be using Promise Keepers material. And if you sign up and give me your email, then Julie will send you the lesson before we meet. And you can go over it, and make notes, and all that stuff. Know exactly what we're going to do. Okay, it's not, don't misunderstand, I'm not teaching the Bible on that meeting, I'm just sharing, you're sharing, and we're growing as friends, because you don't want to go back to the worldly friends, right? Yeah, I, I hope, I hope you know. We, we got to be, us men have to be together, we've got to be tight, and we, we have to know each other and help each other grow in the Lord, and have a safe place to share, and it will be a safe place. You know, and Pastor Siegfried knows, I always say this in the meetings, if anything is said in here is heard out here by me, you'll be asked to leave the meeting. It's a safe place for men. Men need safe places. I do. I need somewhere that I can have that safe with my brothers. So that's the 7th of June. And sign up, give me your email, and you'll get it. So in uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says this. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in times of need. And then one last one, and then I'm done. First John. First John, verse 4. First John, verse 4, and verse, chapter 4, verse 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And I, I always think of that, you know, greater is he that is in me. I go, that thing always goes through my brain, you know. You know, greater is he that is in me. Greater is he that is in me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Love that, that, that thing. Okay, so I've shared my heart with you, and thank you for allowing me to do that. Uh, if JoJo could come up. And if you come up to the altar, don't think you're getting any of the candy, but you can... <laughs> Don't eat the candy. Remember the, <laughs> remember the, remember the sermon title. <laughs>